right, yeah, good afternoon. My name is Nathan Eggie. Um, thank you for sticking around to the end of the day. Today I'll be talking about uh, executable code golf, um, the idea of making very tiny binaries for some constrained systems. Great, so um, what do we mean by code golf? So this is the Wikipedia definition, which I thought was really great because it uses the word recreational computer programming. And so the idea is that um, these are contests that uh, people participate in where the, there's some like goal, you know, write a program that does this algorithm, and then people work to kind of like whittle down the size of that program, either, you know, you know, using different programming languages or different clever things in the, um, in the, in the algorithm design. But the idea is that eventually you get to this like shortest possible source code that, that implements it. And there's some examples of this. Um, Stack, uh, Stack Exchange has a great online code golf um, website. There's this JavaScript 1K. That's what's neat about that is that um, you know, the source code is, is in fact the binary. And there, there's this Hugi size coding contest that I participated in a long time ago. All right, but what is executable code golf? And so here the idea is that it's not the source code we care about, it's actually the compiled binary. And so let me give you an example of uh, one of my favorite uh, code golf programs. So this is a paint program in 16 bytes. And so this guy, um, Helmut, basically uh, wrote, a, wrote a tiny program. This is a, a MS-DOS COM program. And basically, it iterates between reading the cursor or the, the mouse location and then writing a pixel. And it kind of goes back and forth. And the clever part is that you know, as you click different buttons, the different buttons correspond to different colors, and you can actually like paint things. And so I think this is a pretty cool, pretty cool example. And it sort of is going to set the stage for what we're going to talk about here. So if you're not into this sort of thing, um, you've been warned. <laughs> All right. So this is my hobby, right? I make 256-byte animations. So this is a you know, type of, of code golf, but it's also sort of a type of generative art. So the idea is you, know, you have these tiny programs, and they like, have these, you know, uh, produce these like, real-time animations, and you can go to these contests, and people compete for who has the coolest animation. Um, what's fun about this is that the size of the binary pretty much explicitly tells you what platform you're gonna be on, right? So just like the previous program, kind of your only choice for doing effective things is to do it as like a DOS com file. So that's one of the things we're gonna be talking about today. Um, these things typically have no uh, music to them, although people have done that. They typically are a single effect, you know, single animation, although people have made multi animations. There's really no, no drawn art, um, and there's usually no text because text takes a lot of space. Uh, but what's really cool about this is that um, the language and the platform we're using is fixed, right? It's this, you know, DOS API from the 80s, but they keep using modern computers, right? So every year, like, they're putting the, like, free DOS on some modern machine. And so, like, last year, we had, like, a 5 gigahertz machine, and you could do some pretty awesome things with, like, 5 gigahertz um, when you're writing assembly. <laughs> All right, cool. So um, there are many different categories for these contests. So there's a huge spectrum, right? Some of them go as low as 32 bytes. I showed you a 16 byte one. Um, and then as you get bigger, you know, like when you're at this, this very tiny size, you, there's certain optimizations you can do. Um, as you get bigger, you can start using more algorithms to get some emergent behavior. You can do some like procedural textures, you can make sounds. Um, as you get bigger than that, you start to be able to use data structures and do like mesh generation. And you know, like a, a lot of these sophisticated ones have like full, like rigid body physics engines in them and are doing some like crazy keyframing and scripting. Um, What's interesting is that right around here, uh, you get to, it becomes feasible to start thinking about like compressing the binary, right? So like you now have enough bits or enough um, space in your executable where like you could have a payload and you could have a decompressor and like that may actually get you more than if you just wrote it by hand. And so, you know, where before you were doing these micro optimizations, like now you're thinking about like how do I write things that compress well? And so that's what we're gonna talk today. Um, also, what's really interesting is we're gonna focus primarily at the low end, right? It's like just when this becomes feasible. So there's lots of other compression techniques as you get bigger for 64Ks and, and larger sizes. Um, those algorithms are really sophisticated and very interesting, but I think what's fascinating is at the very beginning where this becomes feasible, there's like some very specific algorithms that are kind of interesting and effective. And we're gonna talk about those today. All right, um, so looking at that, that size range, like there's sort of this question of like, why do people mostly develop on Windows, right? So if you were to compare these two platforms, they, they basically um, are getting really close to equivalent. So in the early days, you know, maybe it was difficult to do graphics on Linux because like, are you doing it against 
X11? Are you using SDL? Like, is there GL? But now, you know, pretty much uh, OpenGL is universal. Um, the SDKs for some of these GPUs are being released concurrently on the different platforms. We've got like really good debuggers. Um, sound effects is no longer hard, right? There's not like a dozen different sound platforms you can almost guarantee you have also. And then a lot of the work that's being done on uh, soft synthesizers is actually completely cross-platform, right? In some cases, even on the GPU. So if the technology is basically saying, like, why are there so few Linux entries? And my hypothesis is because the tools for doing binary compression are really poor. And so what happens is, if you go back here, right, like if you're trying to write this like animation and you can't use as many bits to like make that animation, you're not competitive, so people just basically don't, don't work on this platform. And so the idea is that maybe we can fix that. All right, so this is what the state of art looks like for um, doing binary compression in Linux. It's basically just like we were doing with cab dropping. Um, these are actual decompression algorithms I found at the top of, of basically shell scripts. And so um, what's interesting is um, I, I picked these three because the first one um, you know, decompresses and runs the program, but it leaves the binary. The second one actually removes it. Um, and then the third one removes it, but also like cats its output to A play, right? So that's how it gets sound. Um, and these are all kind of mostly small. They all take advantage of essentially this LZ-based um, uh, decompression that's on the platform, which makes it really easy to integrate, right? Because you can just um, you know, pipe this through gzip and then append this line. Uh, but the, the decompressor is small, it's very fast, uh, but it's kind of sloppy. Um, sometimes it doesn't work because you know, that directory, like the drive is mounted read-only or that temp's not there or it's full or whatever. Um, and then also this dictionary-based compression algorithms don't exploit the self-similarity that's in uh, x86 assembly. So we're gonna take a closer look at that. This is what modern binary compressors look like. So these are the ones that um, are on Windows. There's basically two that are being used today. Um, the first is called Crinkler, and it's targeted at kind of the very small size. It goes roughly from 1K to 16K. There are maybe two or three different flavors of the algorithm that are in there. Um, there's also something called K-Crunchy, which is um, mostly targeted at, at 64Ks, and so pretty much if you were to go download any of the, the um, modern releases in those categories, like they're basically using one of these two compressors. They're both based on this pack family of compression algorithms, um, plus some interesting binary transformations at the end, um, and there like, you know, you'd pre-transform the binary, do your compression, like post-transform the binary, and as long as you know, they match up, you're fine. Uh, the pros is that they have very good compression. Um, it's pretty much across the board you get 20% just because of the way the context modeling is done. Um, and the uh, algorithms are, are designed specifically for 32-bit x86, so the nice thing about that is those instructions are smaller and then they compress better, so you get a lot more um, bang for your, for your bit. Uh, but the cons are that they're only available in Windows, they're very slow to do encoding, um, and the decom decoder complexity is kind of nuts, right? So like some of these use hundreds of megabytes of memory. Um, they may take a long time. Famously, you'll see these like loading screens just like go on and on and on forever. Um, and then, you know, the big problem for people who are trying to do research in this area is that they're closed source and they're proprietary and there's not really much you can do about it. All right. So, hey, open source, we're gonna fix this. I have this uh, new linker project called Xlink and the goal is to produce an open source uh, link time compressor for these non-Windows platforms, right? So like the Windows ones are solved, there's lots of other platforms, like this is gonna target those. Uh, the goal is to look initially at four kilobyte uh, binaries. Um, the, the algorithms in Crinkler were, were essentially based off this PAC1 paper that um, was published in 2002, and so we're gonna use those, those algorithms. There's a few transformations you can do at that size that are still meaningful, and I'll talk about them a little later. Um, and then I'll, my, my main interest is to kind of explore other encoder algorithms, right? So I do uh, video compression for a living. There's like some clever things you can do if you are trying to do um, uh, adaptive encoding, like if you know, um, you know what your context models look like, you may be able to do some clever tricks that basically like to explore this space in a way that converges to something that's a little smaller. So we'd like to apply some of those algorithms. All right, so what, is, what does PAC look like? Um, so it's really a whole family of algorithms, and I think uh, the author, 
Matt Mahoney is up to like PAC9 right now with like tons of different letters after each one for small variations. But generally, they're all basically trying to do um, two things that, that sort of um, make up this PAC algorithm. So the first is that they use uh, this mixture of context models to predict the probability for decoding the next bit. Um, and I'll talk more about that. But what's nice, what's, what's interesting about that is that he's designed some context models that are specific to certain types of data. So if you have text files, there's like a set of models for that. If you've got um, binary data, there's a set of models for that. If you've got like fixed column data, there's a set of models for that. And then the other thing is that they all use um, arithmetic range coding, right? They're all gonna code these, these binary symbols using arithmetic range coder, uh, an arithmetic range coder. Um, and so if you wanna think about like what does the decoder look like, it's really simple. Like you, you start decoding and like while you need more bits, like you like guess what the probability will be, decode a bit and you just keep doing this over and over again. All right, so let's talk about what arithmetic range coding is. Um, for those who don't know, I'm, I'll try to go through this quickly and not make this too complicated, but the idea is basically I'm going to record a series of bits that have some probability and I'll start with a range between zero and one and every time I write down a bit, like I'll have a probability model for that bit and then I'll go encode it and every time I do that, I'll subdivide that range and I'll be left with half of it. Um, and if I did a good job at estimating the probability, like the bit will be in the larger half and I'll gain something by encoding this way and if I guess poorly, like the bit will be in the smaller half, it'll be less efficient than if I had just wrote the bit down. And so in this example, it um, starts out 50-50 because we don't know anything, you know, it codes a zero. Um, then the range is mapped to zero from, from uh, zero to, to a half, then it goes through and codes a one, and now it's mapped from, um, you know, whatever, 0.125 to a half. And you can see as you go through, like the ranges are expanding, and at the very end, I'm left with this range, you know, 0.125 to whatever, 0.26 something. And so in order to uh, serialize this range, I basically just need to write down enough bits so that whatever is left after the bits I've written down defines a range that sits in, as like a subrange inside this range. And so in this case, um, all I need to do is output bit 001. And if I, my decoder can predict those probabilities, I've like saved a bit. All right, great. Um, so there's some interesting properties here. Uh, you got some implementation choices, like how many bits you use for the range. Um, you know, it's completely variable, and so we typically use the machine word size how you update the partition after each bit. There's some partition algorithms where you can trade off accuracy for speed, um, for size of implementation. Um, the cool thing is that you're pretty much guaranteed to be um, close to the Shannon limit. So for any set of inputs with probabilities and bits, the overhead of ideally coding it versus what you get out of a like, range coder is basically like one bit of overhead. And then um, the cool thing is because I said earlier like the output is any number in that final range, we can actually stick other data at the end of it if we need to, and we'll talk about that a little later. All right, so we're now looking at um, some interesting things that, that the PAC algorithm does around context modeling and context mixing. And so this, uh, like I said earlier, the PACs of algorithms define a bunch of models, and then they talk about like how do you combine those models to get a new probability, and so here, uh, the goal is that for each bit to decode, <clears throat> we're gonna predict the probability from these previous bits. And so PAC1 had like a bunch of different models, um, some that don't make any sense in the context of what we're doing, right? Like fixed length records or, you know, uh, string matching, right? Like they'll be broken up into, into words around spaces. Um, but, you know, in the end, we're gonna basically still wanna have a final probability that's a linear mixing of these models. Um, the choice that Crinkler made was to basically take the n-gram model and the sparse model and, and use those as your, as your context models. Don't, don't worry about if these uh, you know, technical words around um, information theory are things you haven't heard before. I'll, I'll, I'll explain exactly what this means. So this is what we mean by uh, sparse n-gram context modeling. And so I'll do it by example. So um, for each bit, we're basically gonna have an eight gram, so we're gonna look at the previous eight bytes plus this partially decoded byte, right? So we've already decoded some, some bits in the byte and we have like the previous eight bytes that we've decoded. Um, we have a position that we're decoding in and our context models are these masks that tell you like which of the previous eight bytes to consider when, when building up that, that probability. And so in this case, uh, the mask 
that I've got here says that you're only gonna look at the, the third last byte. And so in this example where we have Mississippi, if you were to apply this mask um, for the, the last I, like you're decoding that byte, say the zero is bit in that byte, the mask comes up as I, and what you wanna know is the previous time I've seen this byte with this mask, what has been the probability of the zeroth bit? And so if we kind of like look back as to how this algorithm evolved, like the previous times we had an I in that position, like we decoded an I. And so we would expect that this context model that's been updated here has made that very likely. And so when we go to code it with that arithmetic range coder, it's gonna be very cheap to code. I'm not gonna get into much more detail on that. Um, except for to say that when we do, uh, after we do the, the encoding, right, like we'll know if we were right, like we have this guess on the probability and then we have this like bit that we coded, and then we'll go and update these counts to let us know what the probability is. All right, and so the way the mixing is done is we have a whole bunch of these models and we assign them some weights and when we go to get a probability, we'll look over these sparse models and we'll load these counts and then we'll multiply and the counts are, you know, basically uh, proportional to how many times have I seen a zero for this model and how many times have I seen a one. And so if I've seen a zero bit more, like that'll be more likely. Uh, we compute this weighted sum and then we can now get a probability with, with the uh, division at the bottom. All right, uh, I mentioned this was like a non-stationary n-gram and so what does that mean? And so basically what that means is that as we're doing this decoding, like recent information is more important than previous information. And so there's this temporal model we use to do the updating. So like when I said before, these were the number of times, it, it wasn't exactly true, it's kind of proportional. And so what happens is if you have some, some running counts for a particular context and you saw a zero, you will increment the zero count and you'll you know, basically divide the one count in two. And so what happens is if you're seeing the wrong, like if you, if you um, predicted a, a zero and you saw a zero, like that becomes more likely. And if it switches to starting to see ones, like it swaps pretty quickly. All right, great. So this is what a decoder looks like, right? So we can define an entropy segment um, just basically with all the pieces of information I, I gave you before. So we have the number of bits we wanna decode, we have the number of context models, and a context model has like the, the mask and a weight, and then we have this like number that's multi-precision between zero and one. So given that information, you can basically implement a decoder. Um, and uh, what's interesting is, you know, you basically do it a bit at a time, or like you like guess the probability, decode a bit, then update. Uh, but if you've been paying attention, you'll have a question about like, what does this, what does this actually do? Because um, when you have an eight gram, that's 64 bits of potential context, and you have seven bits of the previously, or the, the, the partially decoded bits, so like you have this two to the 71 space of like context you have to carry around, and that's a lot of data. And so all we do is use a hash table, and we just kind of, you know, allocate some memory, um, have some hash function, and stick these counts in there, and if there's a collision, we just don't care, because we're, you know, gonna do the same thing on the encoder and decoder, and if we're kind of wrong, like, Still gonna compress. All right, so why, is this, why does this work better than, than LZ-based compression, right? So remember, LZ-based is this dictionary, so as you're like, you know, doing this decode, you're gonna write down the previous, you know, substrings you've seen, and then later you'll like, you'll point back to them. And so the reason we're better than LZ-based compression is there's a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that, you know, if we're using a 32-bit arithmetic range coder, like we can potentially store bits with like a very, very, very tiny amount of information, right? Like we potentially can store one bit with like this very tiny fraction of a bit. Um, the other reason this works really well is that that n-gram context model maps very nicely to, to machine code. So if you can think, if you, if you look at this example here, like this is a vector addition, and you know, you look at like the first byte of all these instructions, they're, they're all kind of nearly the same. And so that means that you can create these context models that basically reach back and say, hey, for this particular byte, like, look at the one that was so many before, and you can get a very accurate prediction for that. And so, like, if you have a whole bunch of floating point operations and you kind of put them near each other, suddenly, like, your prediction gets really good. Um, the weights are also tunable, so you can go through, and if some context model does a really great job, you can, like, give that higher priority. 
And then the, the real reason is that, you know, our decoder with that hash table is like holding a massive amount of context, right? So like all possible combinations of these contexts, um, if your models are chosen well and your weights are chosen well, like you're gonna have probabilities that make a lot of sense for the, the bits you're decoding. And so this is why uh, these Windows-based um, binary compressors that are based on, on this PAC algorithm do so much better than, than what we're seeing with, uh, with these LZ-based uh, Linux compressors. All right, great, but there's more things we can do, right? So we're not, we're not done yet. So um, typically, uh, particularly with this, this sort of EXE compression or binary compression in, in Linux, like you'll go through and do the whole thing, you'll like compile, assemble, link, and then like you take that binary and go and make an attempt at compressing it. Um, but what if we were to put that as part of the linker stage, right? So now suddenly, when we're going through to make decisions about the modeling, you know, the models and weights we use, we can actually look at the data we have and perhaps transform it or use that data to infer what the, the model should be. And we can do a little bit better because we've got some flexibility. So what is in an object file? I'm sure all of you know this, uh, but basically you have these segments or these sections, code and data, and you have this BSS section which is uninitialized data so it doesn't cost you anything. You've got some public symbols, um, which are like the symbols the object exposes, and it's got some externs, which are the ones it depends on, and it's got these relock records. And so this is where all the magic happens, right? When you go through to like link your, your binary together, you'll like lay these segments out or these sections out, um, and then you'll look at the metadata and, and that relic uh, record, and that will tell you like, how you fix up the, the, the bytes for it to, uh, to turn into a, like a well-formed executable. So I've got an example of, of that algorithm here. Um, the, the real trick is that um, in a sort of naive algorithm, like whatever O files or libraries you give it, the, the linker just like takes all of them. It'll take all, all the sections, it'll take um, all, all of the, uh, you know, functions that maybe are, are called or not called, the data that's may, maybe used or not used, it'll sort it all, put all the code together, put all the data together, put all the initialized stuff together, and then it will, like, go through the process of trying to fix everything up. And so, for example, here's another um, floating point a vector function that does a scale. So the, the scale label is a public, right, it's the one it exposes. The VR multiply, the vector multiply is an, is an extern, and then the length, which is like some internal data structure, is like a, a, like a, a, a relic, right? Like you're gonna have to like figure out where that data ended up being placed in the binary and then, then go fix that space up. Um, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this here is that the call function will have a relative address for that um, symbol but the, the load there will have an absolute one, right? So those are different types of addresses, and so you have to deal with, with that when you make a linker. So we can do something a little smarter. Um, if instead of just taking everything you handle linker, we start from the entry point and do this like transitive closure where we walk all the dependencies and figure out like what are the actual functions you call and then what are the functions that those call and what are the data elements that are needed. Um, and you can potentially cull that down a little bit, and so when you're doing these size optimized linkers, like you're gonna wanna um, have your compiler put every function in its own section, so then you can kind of exclude them. All right, uh, but there are other things you can do, right? So besides just only taking the things that you need, um, because we don't really care how the actual functions are ordered, we can like permute them and mix them up and put the ones that are slimmer near each other. Um, we can also modify the data so that um, data that's referenced from the same function, maybe is near each other, and that way it has the, the same absolute address. And so the general idea is to um, like pick some ordering that compresses well with the entry model we have, and then uh, also use different entry segments for code and data because they look different, right? And it's like that actually generalizes if you, you know, have some way to know that you've got code that will compress well together, like you could actually have like many, many of these EC segments. But right now we just split it into one for code and one for data. And so this, this very simple algorithm is you just like, you know, do the sort, figure out what the code and data segments are, like randomly permute them, do the fix ups, link it, and then try to compress it. And just iterate this over and over again and like see which one's the best and like at some point you give up. And like this is what the state of the art is. 
And I mean, to be very clear, the, the reason this is the state of the art is that there's like no public implementation. So hopefully we can fix that. All right, so um, let's talk about the actual implementation I made. So the, the idea was to make something that would link Linux, you know, 32 bit ELF binaries. But to do that properly requires a lot of the same tricks that Crinkler did in order to like get a very small binary. And that means like going in and doing like ELF header mangling and like sticking some of the code that does decompression in there and like trying to play games with the, the fields. Um, but you also need to be able to load dynamic libraries, right? Because like all the useful uh, animations are gonna be using OpenGL or they're gonna be using SDL to get like a, a window buffer. And so I wanted to not worry about those concerns. And so I decided to go the other way. Instead of making like a linker for these modern platforms, I'm gonna go and find like what's the oldest platform I could possibly make this algorithm work on um, that's still useful for me and just worry about the compression side of it, like make, making sure that I get the uh, decompressor right, like coming up with good algorithms for doing encoding, and uh, then later I can come back and figure out how to do the, the part that's platform specific. And so of course, I picked a 40 megahertz 386, and the reason I picked a 386 is that that was the first, there's two reasons, that was the first uh, CPU where I had 32-bit addressing, like I need a lot of memory for that hash table, but it also has like the, the bit opcode, which me like read a bit, which is like an efficient way to get a bit. Um, there's no headers for MS DOS com files like we talked about, and it's completely statically linked, so I don't have to worry about loading any libraries. But programming in MS DOS is kind of annoying because, like, you boot up into 16 bit real mode, and you've got a segmented memory, so you can't actually access all the memory. You have only like 640K because the rest of it's used for accessing video memory or BIOS ROMs. Um, there's this way to get there through banking, but it's really inconvenient and cumbersome and not efficient in terms of um, execution size. Um, but the good news is we do have a 32-bit uh, addressing mode, and the, the board I have can support 32 megabytes. I'm, I'm not sure if you can get more, but that's what I have. So this looks like it might, might work. Um, so the first problem you have is that you can't access enough memory for a hash table, and the reason for this is that you're, you're in this like 16-bit segmented mode. So the, the trick is to like switch the processor to protected mode. Um, but doing that, if you remember from I don't know, maybe, maybe not all of you remember, but if you played a lot of games back in the 90s, like you'd start your game up and it would say DOS 4GW extender or PMODW extender, and like this was like a whole stub that sat in front of your binary that would be the DPMI host and would like provide the APIs, let you switch the um, processor into protected mode and like have like sane APIs for allocating memory. And that thing, you know, even, even the smallest one was still about 12 kilobytes, so that's not exactly useful. Um, <laughs> But it turns out that um, you can actually run a DPMI host separately. So some of the memory managers from, from those days actually had this as part of their uh, installation stuff, like it used quarter deck, like that had a DPMI host. Um, some strange versions of, of like Japanese DOS came with a memory manager. And so you can write against that API that already exists and you can actually get a very tiny DPMI client that like switches you into production mode in 48 bytes. Um, if you're interested in that, you can look at the source code, I won't, tell you, I, won't, I won't spoil it for you, but I do some really crazy things to make that work. All right, the second thing is that we want 32-bit registers so we can have a more accurate entry coder, but hey, guess what, we're done if we switch to protected mode, so that was easy. And then finally, the problem is that if we have this, like we're gonna be calling this hashing function a lot, and the way the hash function um, was designed originally is that it basically for each uh, byte in that context model that you were gonna use, you'd have to like do a multiply. And so because you're gonna call the hash function once to le like load the, the counts and then later to store the counts, and each of the models might you know, reference several bytes, like that's like, could be hundreds of multiplies you know, per bit, which kind of is terrible. And so you just replace it with a rotate left. And now it's a lot, lot cheaper. All right, so it turns out I wrote this. This is what it looks like. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of it, but I thought it would be fun to just you know, color code things so you can see how much of it is wasted in things like you know, initializing, pre initializing protected mode and um, allocating memory. A lot of the stuff that you thought would be hard is actually pretty cheap, right? So like indexing the hash table is, is cheap, like updating the counts is pretty cheap, even though it looked like a bunch of logic, there's some clever bit tricks you can use to make that effective. So a lot of the overhead is really in just, you know, doing the initialization and like rustling with some of the APIs. All right, and the cool thing is also it's, it's um, 255 bytes. So that means that for, you know, DOS 
4K intros, like this is a reasonable amount of the binary to, to spend on the decompression stub if like you can get your payload well above four kilobytes. So that's actually kind of effective um, use of space. All right, so I was gonna try to do a quick demo of what this looks like. So, hmm. All right, so this is a, uh, oops. This is a very simple program that just prints out lorem ipsum, right? And it, it does it as a 32-bit, um, 30-bit uh, program, and so this is cool because like we're gonna switch to protected mode, so you actually could use the entire address space, and it prints that out. And so this is what the linker uh, looks like. And if you run that, like you get no output because we didn't compress it, we just linked it normally. And if you do dash p, it will then go and run that algorithm. And so what you can see there is that um, there were 22 bytes for the code segment, and there were 444 bytes for the data segment. It used different, uh, made like two different EC segments. You can see the, the models it, it chose and the weights it chose, and then you can see um, the total size of the compressed data. And so in this case, it was 272 bytes, and the header was a certain size. So like, uh, one thing we could do is we can run it by itself, and we can see, you know, how big is that? And that's, you know, 523, and then if we run it with the compressor, whoa. And I got bigger. And the reason it got bigger is we used two EC segments, right, and there's like a bunch of overhead, namely like the number of bits and then the weights and then the models. And so that wasn't really very useful. But I added a thing to say use just a single EC segment. And so now um, it's smaller. So hey, we made, it, we made a file that was actually smaller. If we want to run this, right, because like we'd like to see that it works, We can run it in DOSBox. And so here's DOSBox. And we'll go ahead and run it. And it did nothing. And that's no good, right? And the reason it did nothing is because, of course, there's no DPMI host in DOSBox. But we just loaded one now. And like, hey, it worked. So that's. Now I can, I, I can see Tim there looking at me saying, well, wait a minute, you just cheated, right? Because this DPMI host is 35 kilobytes. Like, <laughs> well, it's not, it's not fair. Like, what's going on here? All right, so fine. Because Tim, Tim asked for it. <laughs> what we have here, if I can make this fit is we have a virtual machine that's running real DOS. And what we'll do is again, like here's the same program, kind of annoyed at the sizing. Yeah, look, now it's smaller. All right, so now if we run it, same thing, because again, we're in DOS and there's no like DPMI host. But we can run Windows. And it turns out that from Windows 3.0, there's this NT DVM, which is a DOS virtual machine, but it has in it a DPMI host. And so now it works fine. So this is a legit 
entry in whatever the 519 byte category is. And if I were to actually like try to compete with this, I would show up with like a machine and I would boot Windows 3.0 and I would tell the organizers like, what's the problem? This is a, like a legit platform from the year 1990. <laughs> All right, so that's the demo. And now we're gonna try to go back to the original question was does this actually work for Linux binaries, right? That was like the whole reason we did this. And so what we wanna do is we wanna test to see that this compression algorithm like is feasible and like gives an appreciable gain for you know, some corpus of like Linux intros. But the problem is I don't have that because I don't have the, the source code to them and so I can't actually run this linker on them and also my linker doesn't link Linux binaries anyhow, but forget that. So what we'll do is we'll just take some corpus of actual Linux intros and because like the decompressor is the first line of the, the bash script, we'll just decompress them and then we'll recompress whatever that thing is with this pack algorithm and like we'll look at what the size is and that will give us an, an informative, you know, idea of is this compression algorithm good? And you might ask like is this a fair compre you know, comparison and like I'm gonna wave my hands and say yes because the people who wrote those like designed them to work like they rearranged all the bits in there to be effect like efficiently compressed with an LZ algorithm and I'm using a different algorithm that should strictly be better um, if I had the source code I could rearrange the bits, right? So like it's definitely like at least an upper bound. All right, cool, so here's, oh, let me make this bigger. All right, so here's a, uh, a set of um, four kilobyte intros uh, for Linux and they're like over the past decade, right? So they're like a, like a variety of like shader based and um, you know, fixed function based and like in some cases just pure software based. And so what I did was I uncompressed them. And that's the uncompressed size in blue and then in orange is like their actual size on disk and in green is what happens if you just do the compression with, with this pack algorithm, right? So like I'm getting about seven and a half percent improvement, like if I could rearrange the bits inside, like I probably could get a lot better than that. But that seems like reasonable, you know, being able to, to get 300 bytes, like you could do something with that. Particularly if it's a shader because like that's the compressed size and so if I'm giving myself 300 bytes of like text, like that'll be 500 or 800 bytes or something and that's, that's pretty useful. All right, so what about for 1K intros? Like here's a set of them, again over the same time frame, so they got like a mixture of, of uh, functions or um, implementations and there, you know, we see something very similar um, except for in this case, we're actually getting about 15% improvement which I thought was a little bit surprising and what, what, what that actually means is that LZ compression is kind of you know, garbage for this because there's just not enough data to have eff like efficient dictionaries. All right, great. So you're probably asking like, that's cool and all and maybe I'll make some like tiny demos but like why should I care about binary compression in 2019? Like I write Rust and it statically links everything and my binaries are huge and everything is great. <laughs> um, and so there's a couple of good reasons, right? Like maybe, maybe you wanna reduce the, the size of your binary on disk, like suppose you're in these like very resource constrained environments, like having some smaller binaries could be useful. Um, it's also cheaper to transmit, so there's some like satellite relaying companies where there's a cost per bit, so having like smaller binaries could be helpful there. Maybe this is useful for doing obfuscation, it's like much harder to know what's going on if you see just like this giant number between zero and one. Um, perhaps there's a security consideration, right, like if a bit gets twiddled, it definitely will not execute, right, because it's gonna create garbage. And then, um, there's also sort of like an interesting idea of that perhaps you could go in and do per function on the fly decompression, right? So like if you were doing some reverse engineering for you know informative purposes and like you went through and rearranged some function to give you enough room, you could like stick your own function in and have that you know dispatch and execute. So there's some interesting things you might be able to do with that. Um, I talked a lot about these future directions, so there's like better encoder algorithms I'd like to try. Um, I'd like to make it actually work for Linux. Uh, I like to support 64K intros, so there's a whole different class of algorithms there, and there's some more, more transformations I wanna do. Plus, if anyone would like to help me with ARM support, that'd be very cool. And that's it. Any questions? Are you volunteering to make Rust binaries smaller? No. 
Have you seen RANS with JSEC Seeker or Houston Z Standard? Yeah, Is so that- I'm glad you asked that. So I actually implemented um, both this ranged arithmetic coder using you know the the range and an ANS version of it. In fact, like the source code that's up on GitHub right now, like lets you toggle between them if you want. Now the decoder obviously doesn't doesn't work with ANS, but like you could try the encoder to see if there's any appreciable difference, right? That was why I implemented them both. Um, <coughs> so the reason you don't want to use ANS is if you look at the implementation for the ranged um, arithmetic decoder, and I was going to have the assembly up here, but I, I didn't think it was that important. You can basically do it with a multiply followed by a divide, and because you're in 32-bit assembly, like your multiply will stick it in EDX, EAX, and your divide will take it out of there. If you look at ANS, I believe it was a multiply, divide, multiply, and so it was actually like more computationally expensive and larger, and I was on a 3D6, so I thought it was not useful. You mentioned asking for help with regards to ARM. What help exactly? Right. Um, so, obviously, I wrote my own linker, and right now I parse these terrible formats called OMF that were from like the late 70s, and they're, they're not useful if I'd like to link any Linux binary. So help in just parsing normal cough O files and things that are maybe reusable across the different platforms would be great. Some questions? Going, going, done. Thank you very much. That was-